And yeah, there we go. We we are live. Good good evening, everybody. Um, welcome along to our blether. As you can see, it is just me tonight. Mike's uh, down in Glasgow. He's busy doing some more whiskey ambassador training in its couple of days. Uh, so it's just me again. Um, uh, we did this uh, a while back with just me and Alistair Day. So uh, tonight we've got a, another fabulous guest, um, and I'm hoping that you'll all enjoy the chat. Um, Feel free. It's it's always nice when there's just the two of us if uh, people interact. Uh, so feel free to give us your questions um, and and get involved. And I'm sure uh, Ingvar would be interested to to field some of your questions and uh, tell you a bit more about himself. Um, and also tell us what's in your glass uh, tonight, guys. So uh, let us know what you're what you're drinking as well. Um, for your information, I have poured myself um, a lovely little Kubalkin, uh, which is a uh, peated a uh, tomato um, and one that I've, uh, I've been really enjoying lately so I thought I'd give that a go again tonight. Um, so without uh, further ado you're obviously not here to to listen to me and um, blathering so I will uh, get Ingvar in and we will uh, find out how he is. And here we go. Good evening sir. Hi Russell. Thank you. you, thank you so much for uh, for for coming along to our chat tonight. Um, I I've, I've been a purchaser of the the whiskey yearbook uh, for the last I think five editions, um, and and for me, um, I think I described it to somebody else today when they said, "What are you doing tonight?" I said, "I'm talking to yourself." Said the the book that uh, that you produce, and I said, "It's it's also known as my Bible." Uh, because this is my, my go-to for any piece of information. Be, be careful um, about using the word Bible when you talk about <laughs> Well, indeed, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> it's my, well, I should say it's my ultimate reference book. That would be... Okay, good, good. That's better. <laughs> I, should, I should maybe change that. Of course, <laughs> that's a, quite a controversial subject these days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, how, how are you? Are you, are you if, in Malmo tonight? I am in Malmö today, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, I'm heading to Amsterdam um, tomorrow morning uh, to visit my daughter. She's uh, staying there, studying. Okay, so, okay. Yeah, nice. yeah. yeah. So not not a whiskey trip. And uh, I don't think, I don't drink Geneva. I, I, I've never managed to drink Geneva. I mean, I mean, obviously that's a Dutch national drink, but it's not Geneva. For me. Geneva. Yeah. 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 We, I mean, obviously the the, the precursor to gin, um, and, and whenever we do a gin taste, and we always talk about the history with Geneva, and then how it kind of translated into gin, and and the long kind of route that it took to the yeah, Scottish craft. Yeah, I, I did the mistake the last time I was in Amsterdam. I did the mistake of going into a liquor shop, and um, they had lots of Genevas there. And the guy came up to me and said, "Do, do you know what Geneva is?" Yeah, it's it's like uh, some kind of copy of gin, isn't it? And he <laughs> almost threw me out. No, no, it started with your neighbor, then June. So, okay, take it easy. Take it easy. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, so where, where did it all begin for you with whiskey then? And I think the moment I, I got hooked on, on malt whiskey, I, probably I, I, I know I tried whiskies in my late uh, teens, probably Johnny Walker Red or whatever was available. But uh, the first time was in summer of 1980. Uh, a friend and I, we went to London and we took the train up to Inverness, uh, rented a car, and then we drove the whiskey trail, okay. which in fact was there at the time. Not that many distilleries. We went to Glenfiddich, uh, Glenlivet, uh, Glen Farkas and Strath Isla. So that was in July 1980. And, um, 1980, yeah, yeah. 1980, yeah. Yeah, a long time ago. Yes, yeah. So I, 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 was, I was so hooked because, not just because of the taste of the whiskey, but uh, also uh, the way it was made uh, and where it was made, Scotland uh, as a whole. I mean, th that intrigued me. And many times since then, I've been talking about why people are so fascinated about uh, Scotland. I mean, if we talk about spirits, we have cognac, of course. That's a great spirit. I love it. But who writes any books about that particular part of France called cognac? Oh, who Absolutely. makes films about it? And yeah. we have so many books. We have so much history. Uh, 
about Scotland. So, so for me, since that day, for me, it's not just about the thing I pour into my glass. It's so much more. Uh, so that was when I my interest in, in malt whiskey started. And uh, work-wise, I did so many things for uh, 35 years or so. And then came a moment in, I think it was 2004, when I realized uh, to keep up with everything that was happening in the whiskey world. I bought a lot of books, great books. Thing is, they got outdated in two, three years and they yes. weren't printed. Yep. And then I started relying on, on uh, internet and I saw that same information turned up everywhere and actually the same sentences. So I realized that someone wrote this and most of the others copied it. So how on earth could I trust what what was written there? So yes. uh, what, what I missed for, for my own part was some kind of, of book, a yearbook that, that covered the, my whiskey interest and I could rely on. And there were yearbooks about everything, about guns, cars, uh, animals, uh, whatever, yeah. nothing about yeah. whiskey. Yeah. And some of my professional life has been spent uh, in the printing business. So I um, am publishing. So I realized, well, why not combine my interest in whiskey with what I know professionally? Yeah. Uh, so I, I took that leap of faith uh, in 2005, and I did the first yearbook, which was then called Malt Whiskey Yearbook 2006. And I'm quite optimistic. So I printed 10,000 copies. Mm -hmm. And I sold 3,000. And I had these pallets with 7,000 copies. <laughs> and I, I thought, what the hell did I do now? But anyway, so next year I printed 5,000 and I sold them. And then I kept yeah. on. So, but that first year, I may be a bit too optimistic. But uh, now I'm working on the 18th uh, edition. And um, yeah, as usual, it's coming out beginning of October every year. Yes, yes. And, and eagerly anticipated. I mean, it's got to the point where I know many people are the same as me, where you 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 start to think and you see um, the availability, and you're like, yeah, come on, here we go. You're so keen to get it and and, yeah, and read it yeah. again. So That's that, good to hear. That's good to hear. Yeah, but but I guess you know, with any new venture, it's always that way where there's a bit of anxiety, and as you say, you you think, yeah, people will want to do this because you think it's a great idea, and yeah. it is a great idea. Um, but I suppose back in 2006 even though what 16 years ago yeah i think i mean it, it hadn't kind of exploded in the way it has in the last five six seven years i suppose um, yeah and, and you're right and a lot of people told me friends told me i mean friends should be supportive shouldn't they but some of them told me ingva i mean this is this whiskey malt whiskey thing is just a fling i mean it, it will it will uh, go away it will fade away in a couple of years and then some other other spirits take that place and um, but it's not i mean it's still it's growing it's growing every year yeah i, I mean and, and and i suppose one of the things we kind of we, we spoke about just before we came on screen was this impact that um being on screen and having to do events on the computer has kind of had and mm -hmm. one of the negative things as you were saying was if you're if you're doing a tasting with 70 people, it's very difficult to connect and actually be part mm -hmm. of that. But having said that, for me, the online kind of period that we went through gave us whiskey enthusiasts and fans far greater contact with mm -hmm. with some of the people in the industry that we might not have had so much time to listen to. Yeah. Um, if we'd yeah. been at a festival, we'd maybe get snippets here and there, but we were actually mm -hmm. able to sit and listen to people for an hour at a time. So. You're so right. I mean, that that's the upside of, of what's been happening now since spring 2020. Uh, what you've been doing, what a lot of people around the world have been doing, uh, getting online and getting, as you say, getting the industry people yeah. online. Yeah. The ones that we rarely see, maybe at the whiskey show somewhere, but then all of a sudden we, we can listen to them, we can see them, and uh, uh, asking them questions about the distilleries, about their products. So it's that, that's definitely at the upside of what we've been going through now for almost yeah two or three years. So I mean, back in 1980, I mean, it was still it was still probably quite unfashionable to for individuals like yourself to actually go and tour distilleries. I know my my father was um was a member of a a, a club a committee that had um, a social bar 
uh, where you know you could get cheap drink and they played bingo and all sorts of social mm. events. And every now and again, the committee would go to a distillery for a visit. And it seemed a very unusual thing, you know, for for me as a young a young person at the time to go and do. And mm. it didn't seem like it was a so that would have been about that kind of era. Um, what what sort of reception did you get from from distilleries when you were visiting back then? Yeah, well, thing. I mean, at that time, I didn't, uh, I hadn't started with the books, uh, so I went on the general tour, which always started, of course, with a film talking about we can't make this amazing whiskey without this amazing water. So you got all that sorry BS uh, about yes. <laughs> being the most important thing. Uh, when you, when you had said, seen the film, you were taking it around and uh, have a look mm. at the bills. And what everybody was waiting for was, of course, coming back and to get the complimentary dram, or if you had paid a few more bucks, you, you, you got a couple more whiskies. So that, that that was the general tour. Yeah. And and I mean, so much has happened since then, if we look at the distillery vista centers. I mean, okay, since I started with a book, people ask me sometimes, which, which distillery should I go to for a great tour? I honestly don't know because I'm yeah. now in the position where I don't do the tours. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. Hopefully, uh, most of the time, I, I get to walk around with the distillery manager because yeah. I booked it before and they know me and they know yeah. the book. So I'm, I'm the yeah. worst person to, to give advice on, on really good whiskey tours. But I know from all my friends that a whiskey tour today is so, so much more than was it was in its infancy in the late 70s early 80s yeah absolutely the uh, uh, cat the uh, our colleague cat housley just said i know totally understand so cat works at glengeedy and i think i think you managed to visit recently with the new malt floors i Are was you... there uh, uh, four weeks ago yeah 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 and that, and that you know that's a nice addition to to the distillery in general they're doing things a little bit differently so it is that kind of different kind of level of experience that you're getting now, yeah, not just course. that, not just that kind of tourist and horrible coffee and no. buy some of this and off you go in your coach I, again. I, I was going to mention about Glengarry. I mean, it's so <clears throat> close to you as well. Mm. Uh, and uh, I was for ten days in in Scotland now a few weeks ago, and my first visit uh, on that session was Glengarry. And I had a walk around with uh, Quanella, the the settlement mm -hmm. yeah. manager. Yeah. And I was so excited to see the Morton floors because I remember the first time I was there was probably in 2005. Okay. And the Morton floors were there, and that was yeah. barley on the floors as, just as a gimmick for the tourists. Yeah. Yeah. And now they were working. Yeah. And another great thing that Langiri did uh, and are, are doing is that they turned uh, the wash still into a direct fire still. Yeah which is so unusual. I mean, you, you're going back in time. Yeah. That, that's not innovation into the future. That's looking for the roots. Yeah. And that's exactly what they're doing. And I, ah, fantastic visit there. Yeah. And, and I, I, I realize where it's coming from now. I mean, if we have the Beam Santori, five Beam Santori distilleries, I mean, they are so influenced by one of their owners, and that's Santori. I mean, Santori are the... Is a company that is looking after the Scottish interests. It's yeah. not Beam. Beam are yeah. focused very much on, on on the American side. So when and that's quite cool, I think, because I mean, in in the was it 16, 17, 18, Masataka Takatsuru went from Japan, a couple of visits to Longmorn and down to Campbelltown. He had his notebook and he was yes. writing everything down, yeah. and then he went to Japan and started uh, yeah. Japanese whiskey wonder. And now Japanese uh, distillery people are coming to Scotland yeah. and saying, why don't you try this? Why yeah. don't you do that? Why don't you try another yeast? Why don't you increase fermentation times? And uh, the Scots, I mean, the ones I've been talking to within Beam Santori, they're, they're really happy to, to share, yeah. To, yeah. To, to get that information. Yeah. Instead of just saying, we've been doing this for 400 years, fuck off. Yeah, I mean, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, indeed. And I think you're right. There is that kind of a, a <clears throat> happiness to be involved in any kind of innovation and change. But there's something about the Scots that are a little bit lacking in confidence to actually maybe go ahead and do that themselves without the encouragement. Yeah. yeah. Elsewhere. Right. So it's it's nice that other people have taken an interest in that to, to kind of push the industry on again. And 
Yeah, um, yeah. There, there, there is a lot of innovation coming around. Um, so yeah, so so you you started life as a as a writer then, in general. No, I, I, my life uh, as a full time writer. I mean that that started in two thousand and four or five mm. with the yearbook. So uh, I, I've been doing uh, general publishing. I, I've been for ten years. I owned a, a chain of retail stores selling outdoor equipment, tents, oh, rucks, okay. sleeping bags, stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that uh, many years ago and uh, did other things for a few years. I, actually, I also had a radio show on the, about uh, English okay. dance band music and American dance band music oh, from fantastic. the 50s and 30s. That, that was, yeah, I, I did it on, on the side. But, uh, yeah, yeah. So I've been doing different things here. Do you, do you miss the DJ stuff than the radio show? Sorry? Do you miss the radio show? If I... Do do you miss it? Do you do you miss doing? No, it? no, 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 no. No. I mean, I, I did that between. I think it was in the early eighties, and uh, mm. uh, I think I did it partly to to finance my studies. But uh, yeah. I, I like the music uh, yeah. at that yeah. time. I don't listen yeah. to it anymore, and I don't miss it. Absolutely not. No. And and in terms of the mountain equipment sales, was that on the back of actually that being part of your? Were you involved as a mountaineer, or was that your hobby at one time? Uh, no, it wasn't. <clears throat> So a friend of mine, we bought uh, three shops that were owned by the uh, Swedish Boy Scout Federation. And mm. uh, they had been around since the early 30s and they weren't doing really well. And we had a few ideas what to bring into the stores. Uh, so we bought them, uh, opened up another 20 stores in, in Sweden, Germany and Denmark. Right. Yeah. Uh, and um, there were 10 really fun years yes quite tiresome uh, at the end we had i think we had 200 people employed and uh, peter and i my friend and i we thought well, was that what we really wanted in the beginning yeah, 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 but yeah. it just kept growing and then we realized no no after 10 years we got tired of it and yeah yeah we solved it i i i remember when i was younger i used to do a bit of hill walking not mount mountaineering to the degree of I could walk or scramble, nothing, no rock climbing or anything like no, that. No. Um, but the, the Monroe's in Scotland, and obviously, you know, a very difficult and dangerous terrain, so you had to know what you were doing, and you had to have some decent kit to make sure you were safe. How um, many was, runs have you done? Uh, probably less than 50. I, I haven't, I've never, I never went to the extent of actually going to the mall. I used to go back and visit the ones I liked, mainly yeah. around about Aberdeenshire. Yeah, um, yeah. I didn't. I didn't tend to travel very far away to to no. get a Um but I was aware of one or two people who were starting businesses in some of the small villages mm. in the side, and how much, how much I was envious of the fact that they were doing that. They were going away and choosing this and choosing that and creating bits of kit. But yeah. then I saw how hard it was. <laughs> they were they were literally <laughs> never. They were never away from their work, and I thought, no. okay. You know, it, it must it must stop being fun after a while when you get so busy with it and get so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose that's the same as anything. Yeah. No, I, I quite like what I've been doing now for close to twenty years. Um, yeah. Being a writer, uh, writing about the stuff I love, going on travels, meeting with people. I mean, it's been perfect. Yeah. 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 Uh, Phil's got a good question there. Um, just we were talking uh, earlier on about this this upward trend um, in the whiskey industry. Phil's just asking: Do you, do you think the popularity of whiskey is sustainable? Do you think that? Do you feel that that trend is going to continue? Uh, I think so. Um, <laughs> that's my guess. Uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of um, challenges ahead. You, you could think about challenges from other types of, of, of spirits and um, we've been talking about rum now for mm -hmm. seven eight years and that would be I mean the closest to if you're a whiskey drinker the the leap over to rum isn't that yeah. big uh, as opposed to if you want to drink tequila or mezcal uh, but I mean rum is going fine uh, I, I don't see it taking any any uh, market shares from from uh, more whiskey, um, tequila on the scale. Talking about that, I mean, it's just uh, tremendous development, especially in the states. It hasn't yeah. happened that much, 
in, in Europe so far, but I think it will. Uh, we saw 10 years ago when gin started exploding. I thought that that would have been a gin fatigue um, a few years ago, but now it's still growing. Yeah. It, it's hard for us to know. I mean, you, you, you've you obviously, you're, you're, you're able to see the bigger picture and the more international picture. Living and working in Scotland, sometimes you get very insular and forget about the wider market out there. Mm. Um, and from, from my point of view, well, there was a customer in the shop today who probably would have been in his maybe late 20s, early 30s, new to whiskey, fascinated by it, wanting to know much more about it. So he's going to become a regular customer because we had a fantastic conversation today He's looking forward to coming back. And there are so many people like that around just now. So mm -hmm. my feeling in Scotland is there's there's many more Scots or, or people from the UK that are getting more and more into it, in, into, mm -hmm. into, into Scotch whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess from a from a bigger picture across the across the planet, then there are other spirits that people will be more engaged with. Um, there are other spirits. And the, the, I mean, there are also other trends that could influence the interest mm -hmm. in, in more whiskey and that's um, that's a new generation of uh, people not drinking alcohol mm -hmm. yeah. and that would influence not of course not only that <clears throat> would influence the entire business yeah uh, i mentioned my daughter when we were talking earlier yeah. uh, she's 25 and uh, she <clears throat> and a lot of her friends i mean they don't drink that much alcohol yeah. not not the way I used to do you know, yeah, yeah. at her age. So, so that, that could be, <clears throat> at the same time, it feels a bit silly to call it a threat I mean, because it's we're talking about people who choose a healthier lifestyle. So yeah. that shouldn't be a threat. But, yeah. but in the terms of, of the, how the spirits business and the alcohol business uh, is looking for the future, I mean, that, that could be a threat. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. But then whiskey is more not just about about drinking. Lots of people buy it to collect it. They buy it to invest in it. Um, yeah. And, and that, that seems to be a trend that's that's growing as well. But it's, it's mm. getting very hard to get your hands on some of these releases. Springbank's a classic example mm. uh, where everybody wants wants a piece of it. And I don't I don't believe that the majority of those are actually buying those bottles to to open and drink. No. Yeah. I, I, Russell, what you're touching upon now, Russell, is one of my, I was going to say favorite topics to talk about, but it's probably one of my hate topics yeah. to talk about yeah. because I, I'm, I'm so not into collecting, investing, yeah. flipping, selling on. <laughs> I, I think absolutely that it's it's so bad in the long run for for uh, for the whiskey business. I mean, I'm not talking about the the bottlings that McCallum uh, are doing for for rich uh, Chinese uh, business people. I mean, that's fine. They were never intended for the likes of us. No, no. But when when we see prices increase <coughs> in, in the in the range where where we, that we are interested in. Yeah. That could easily be affected by this flipping and, and uh, selling on and investing and collecting. And I think it's the problem is uh, I thought that that would uh, ease off uh, a few years ago, but uh, no, no, it's growing. It's, and, I, it's I, I, yeah. I, and I can't see any, any good way of stopping it. I, I know there was a suggestion from someone, I think they were working at Royal, Royal Mile in Edinburgh, and that was a rare. Uh, you rare uh, if it was a uh, spring yeah. bank or whatever it was and people suggested when they come in to buy it tell them that yes you can buy it but just wait a second i'll just rip off the seal yes. then you can buy it yeah yeah <laughs> that would yeah. be amazing you yeah can't absolutely it. And if, if you bought it online you had to agree to have your name written on the on, yeah. on the bottle as well which yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. absolutely fantastic yeah and and you're right. I mean, things like you, you, I think the Daft Mill was the one that got me, a hundred pounds RRP, and then within a couple of weeks, four hundred pounds on auction. You're like, that's yeah. that's crazy. That's absolutely yeah. crazy. Um, uh, but yeah, no, it, it, it's also a pet hate of ours. But listen, before we go any further, I've, I've just realised I haven't actually even asked you before we go into controversial subjects and maybe <laughs> something that you may need something to help soothe your nerves. And what, what's in your glass tonight? What uh, what have you poured for yourself tonight? Today I poured um, ten year old peated Glen Turret. Oh, nice! Yeah, 
Yeah. Something so we're both on a bit of peat. I'm on the peated the tomato. Yeah. And you're yeah. on the peat the so yeah, so so Slange, thank you very much for joining us. Hi. Yeah. Good to see you. So, uh, before before <laughs> before we talk more about flippers and uh, <laughs> and oh, 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 we don't. Oh, we don't. We can talk oh, about we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's one of the things whenever I do tastings and and they, you know, people being people, things like politics suddenly just kind of creep in a little bit, or people will talk about their favourite football team or rugby team, yeah. and it's always no, no, we don't. <laughs> there is no room for politics or sports <laughs> and whiskey tastings. We talk about whiskey and family and dogs and what have you, but not. yeah, because the thing is, well, when I do, I, I do fifteen or twenty tastings here in Sweden uh, every year, and when I start talking about uh, my feelings about collecting and and, and flipping, uh, there will always be 15 or 20 percent in the audience who are collectors, who are flippers. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I, I yeah. and I, I don't mind. Yeah. I mean, I don't mind annoying people, but you, you you're there to have a nice evening for two hours tasting whiskey, and then I start talking about <clears throat> this, this will be the death of, of uh, single malt whiskey as we know it, and then. We could have a nicer evening than talking about that. Absolutely. I mean, I mean the, way, the way I look at it and the way I've always felt about it is if a particular whiskey or a particular bottle is going to attract that interest, then I'm not interested in it because there are so many other bottles out there yes. that are easily accessible and fantastic yeah. to drink. So you just move your attention somewhere else, go and buy the bottle that you can afford that yeah. not everybody's chasing it. Because there is so much out there, it's fantastic. And, and that, you're, you're touching upon something really yeah. important now, because I think that has been enhanced by social media, this yeah. FOMO, fear of missing out. Yeah, yeah. You will see that there's a new bottling from Springbank. You realise there are only 175. And it's presented on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, and yeah. everybody is talking about it. <clears throat> and you don't want to be that one person who didn't get it. Yeah. Even though you know that 95% of the people who are interested won't be able to buy it, yeah. but you don't want to be the loser. Yeah. So instead, they should do exactly what you're saying, Russell. Okay, let's think about it. If I miss out on that spring bank, that will, this year there will probably be 2,000 new single malt whiskies I can choose from. Yeah. So why don't you relax? Because that, I mean, for your own uh, health, it's not good having that feeling Every time you turn on Facebook, oh, they bought that. And they, sometimes it happens in Sweden. They, they take a photo of, of the receipt from the yeah. shop just to show you how much they spent on it. And yeah. Yeah. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? But it's yeah. that, as you say, it's that, it's that kind of social media. It's that need to show and tell people what you're doing. And mm. um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And if, if, you, if you miss <clears throat> out on the new Spring Bank, latest Spring Bank, I suggest you you turn towards Arna Merkin. Mm -hmm. I should predict something. So I predict that Arna Merkin will be in the new spring bank in terms of quality. Yeah. I think so. I mean, it, 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 certainly, it certainly started off as one of the newer, very collectible whiskeys. Um, yeah, and yeah. The, the, the early bottlings. But then it was all dependent on batch size. The bigger the batch, the mm. less collectible it's going to be because more people are going to have it. So... There's not that mm. rarity, and I think if if uh, producers can can try and do that more often, make their batches bigger sizes, then we don't yeah. need to worry yeah. about that that happening. Yeah. And and the flippers aren't going to be attracted to that because no, no. Yeah, and no if, if especially if you're looking towards something in the same style as something you're missing out on, for me at least, Arna Merkin could be a nice uh, replacement for. Uh, mm -hmm. Somewhat young spring bank perhaps. It's yeah, the same style. Yeah. It's the same style. Yeah. I, I recognize something there. I, I bought my first casks at Spring Bank in the late 1990s together with a couple of friends. And we had five yeah. casks there and we, we bottled them uh, after a while. And they were quite young, uh, the first ones we bottled. I remember exactly that taste. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of what we see from Arna Merkin now. Yeah. It, it's definitely one of the. I mean, that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you tonight, actually, because I I, I totally agree with with Arnold Market in terms of quality. Um, but we've got a good handful of new distilleries um, that have sprung yeah. up in the last, gosh, even the last three or four years, but you know, certainly in the last ten years. Mm. Apart from Arnold Market, are, are there other ones that kind of stand out to you, or have you got an opinion on on what some of these newer distilleries are actually delivering in terms of quality? I, I think there are a few. I mean. 
we need, we need to remember that most of these ones are quite young. Uh, not yeah. everyone did like Francis Cuthbert and, and waited and waited and waited until he released Death Mill. But, yeah. but he, yeah. <laughs> he, he could do it. That was his thing. And Death Mill is good. Uh, I mean, I'm impressed with uh, Rasse. Yeah. I think they are doing some great yeah. stuff. That's my second drum tonight. <laughs> that's, my, that's my second drum today. Yeah, it's a fantastic. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah because I think what what they're doing with the um, very yeah. exciting recipe for the maturation, yeah. mixing uh, new chinkapin oak, uh, old rye casks, uh, yeah. Bordeaux casks, and they get the recipe right. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, Al Alistair is, is a fantastic. Uh, you'll, you'll have met and spoken to Alistair plenty of times, I'm sure. Uh, very engaging uh, chap, and he just he seems to know exactly what he's wanting to do. Um, you know, and, and is, is kind of sticking to that kind of principle as well with lots of. Yeah, Alistair you know, is a really good man. Um, yeah. Actually, I had some contact with him today. We were, you, we were talking about it's important for the new producers to have. Uh, substantial amount of stock to, to release to avoid flippers and yeah, i yeah. i believe that the first uh, <clears throat> assay uh, last year i think was around twenty five thousand bottles second one the same and now i heard from alistair today that the two new um signature releases for this year will uh, to six bottles each yeah so that's a good way of yeah of yeah. avoiding flipping yeah. That would be plenty to go around. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. The, the other thing I love that, they, that, that he's doing, he's he's got these he's got these batches where, as you say, he's mixing them with a, a bit of chinkapin, a bit of peated rye, uh, or or you know unpeated and peated uh, rye, um, and also the, um, the 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 Bordeaux uh, cask, and then he's done the same with the sherry. But I love the way that they then break that down and produce each one in single cask. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, I, I just think that's fantastic. Um, and I've, I've not really known anyone else that's actually gone and, and done that kind of way where they, mm -hmm. they, give you, they give you what they've made and then they give you the parts of how they made it. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's, I think that's wonderful. Uh, I, I think uh, going back to memorable tastings that I've had at the various whiskey shows where I've been, I always remember the ones that are talking about deconstructing. Yeah. I remember that there was a, very easy, Glenfiddich 12, and uh, I don't remember who had the tasting, if it was, maybe it was Mark, and he took all the parts that yeah. were a part of the Glenfiddich 12. We tasted them one by one, and then, okay, put together in these different uh, yeah. volumes, we get Glenfiddich 12. So this deconstruction, and you can do your own deconstruction there, <laughs> thanks to uh, Alistair and Rasse, uh, as you say. We have them as single cask, and you can buy the Rasse signature, and then you can find out, okay, this, there I have the chinka pin, there I have the rye. That's yeah. a great idea. Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I think it's great. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to go to Rasse. Have, have you been up to the distillery yet? Have you had a chance to go? I've been there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's a wonderful place to go. The ferry crossing is just, I mean, you're going from a beautiful island to an even... Yes, more beautiful okay. island. 20 um, minutes over to Rasse, it's fantastic. Just, just superb, just absolutely fantastic. Um, so, I mean, it, it, with, with, the, with the new distilleries, uh, do you feel there's room for more? I mean, there's obviously one or two more coming on stream. Do you, do you feel there's still room for more of that? Or do you think we're getting maybe a bit saturated with some of the newer ones? No, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, no. uh, 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 the ones that are opening up now, you will have the really small ones, producing maybe 50, 60,000 litres a year. Uh, you will have a handful of big ones. I mean, uh, um, Art Ross, for instance, I think they have a capacity of 1.5 million litres. Inchdani, of course, is big. Uh, but those two, I mean, uh, they are thinking about releasing some single malls, but they have other plans to, to be a part of a blend. So there are different companies. Um, I, I think there will be uh, room enough because they are not huge, the, these new distilleries. The problem will be for them to sell it. Uh, and not, not that people don't want it, but the distribution, that, that's a key word. 
uh, because if you go to uh, your own shop, I mean, you have certain amount of shelf meters. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't, if anyone comes up to you, okay, we have a new distillery, we have a new release here. Okay, mm -hmm. so where should you put it? Yeah. You have to pick, take something out to put something in. Yeah. So, uh, and the, in that sense, I think what has been emphasized now during COVID is uh, e-commerce. I mean, that you, you can sell bottles uh, very easily in, in many countries at least. Uh, online, and uh, that takes the heat off uh, a physical retailer. And when I say take the heat, off, I don't. Do you do you do uh, online sales as well? We, we we do do online sales, but again, um, most of what we sell online is is in the shop. A apart yeah. from a lot of the limited releases, they tend to they tend to they, they don't get to hit the shelf. And no. we 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 got to say so the way the way that we kind of dealt with this sort of demand or the, the we deal with the demand is that we we make sure that our regular customers and by that we mean that we have customers who we have got a trail that they have used our shop for a period of time to make yeah. some, some decent sales now I, i'll come back to that because it, it needs to be decent sales proper you know, proper customers um and then we we give them an opportunity to enter a ballot and then it's just you know a, it's, mm. it's luck of the draw after that yeah. When, when we when we first introduced that uh, system, we we just stipulated that you needed to be a customer of the shop, and there needed to be a record of that. And pe people were actually buying a bottle of beer online or or a miniature <laughs> just to prove that they'd had a purchase history. So, Cheeky so we, we had we had to kind of change that to make it say, <laughs> um, you know, come on, guys, we're looking at trying people to reward. People will always find a way, you know. They know, will always find know, a way. I know. Um, but yeah, I you know, and, and that, what what happens with with the shops like ours is the, other people just accuse you of making sure that you you've got all your mates sorted out and and such like. And we we don't do that. We genuinely have a fair opportunity at getting bottles mm -hmm. again. But you know, not for just people who turn up and suddenly decide that they're going to be our best friend. We've never met them before in our life. We would yeah. like to have had some kind of relationship with people mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. uh, before we want that to happen. Um, <laughs> But, but he, he, even though I am, I'm a big advocate for um, going to a fiscal uh, store or shop to, 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 to buy things, I occasionally I buy books. Mm. I try to avoid Amazon because I don't like them. But, yeah. but anyway, I, occasionally I buy books online. But generally, I, I want to meet the people, yeah. meet the people in the shop because yeah. they know their stuff. I can talk to them. They can give me recommendations. But it is a grim reality that all these new uh, distilleries, they have to look, uh, not least if they want to sell internationally, they have to look, how can we get our stuff out uh, yeah. online? That, that's, I think it's so important. And especially if we look at, uh, at the non-Scottish distilleries, because I mean, we have 12 or 13 distilleries in Sweden, for instance. Yes. Yeah. Uh, six, seven of them have released uh, the products. And it's fine because uh, you, you can sell it in Sweden and we should, of course, be supportive, which is not always the case, but we should be proud of our own distilleries. But at the same time, there comes, there comes a time when they want to sell it internationally and they have to compete all of a sudden with scotch yes. that has been produced yes. for centuries. They have to compete with, with uh, American whiskies, with Japanese whiskies, Irish whiskies. Yeah. And it's a whole new ball game because nobody yeah. knows anything in the wide world about Swedish whiskey except except for us geeks. We know it because we yeah. want to follow it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and people sometimes ask me because I come from Sweden. What about Scandinavian whiskeys? Will they stand a chance? Yeah, quality wise, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. They uh, don't have a reputation yet. Yeah. Yeah. High, High Coast, McMeeda are both are two that I've sampled lots of and. Yeah, very, really very good. But as you say, but pe people would people say to me in the shop, and I'm 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 happy to try anything from everywhere. Um, I don't have a problem at all. But people say to me, "Do you buy whiskeys from other countries?" And I'm the only reason I say no is because I don't have a budget or or the time because no. there's still so much scotch that I yeah. that I haven't yeah. had a chance to try yet. So before mm. I get around that, you know, I'm I'm not saying I'm anti English whiskey or anti any other whiskey. I just don't have time. 
to, no. to involve that in my life. So yeah. it's not that I wouldn't. It's just that I, I don't have the capacity. And then sometimes you, you will have people, they, they will buy a Swedish whiskey once just to have tried it or... Yeah. They want to show it off to the to to the mates and see. Look what I have! Quite exotic, yeah. isn't it? But I mean, to survive, you need repeat sales. Yes. You need to buy it the second yeah. time, the third yeah. time. You've got to develop That's a following. You have to have a following and a, and a fan base, if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, talking about fan bases, it's one of the things that we often talk about in terms of distilleries. I mean, there I. I, I was thinking about this again the other day and I thought I had five, but I've probably only got four distilleries, I think, that I probably would buy anything that they made because I just love the distilleries. Mm. Are, are there a handful of distilleries in, in, well, in anywhere in the world, not just Scotland, that you would you would always say, if, 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 if you had money in your pocket and you were into a shop, yeah, I'm going to get that because I know I always like that. Are, are there some distilleries that you will always buy things from? Yeah, um, probably a couple. I I usually, there is one distillery that I always trusted and relied on, and that's that's uh, Glenmorangie. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, because their 10 year old original is always a uh, couple of bottles at home. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a it's really good dram. Uh, it's a dram that you could offer to anyone, they, they will like it. But then I uh, enjoy their uh, older ones, 18. I don't know if the 25-year-old is still around. I don't know. but And then, of course, you have three really good wood finishes. Uh, La Santa, Nectador, and, and um, what, what's the port version? Oh. Um, Quinta Ruben. Quinta Ruben. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, really well made and uh, then every year you have some odd things coming out uh, special releases so Germania is a, a distillery I trust very much uh, and I, I was quite not surprised because that's the thing that Bill Lumsden would do but they released the X by Glen uh which is a you could say to be brutal a simpler version of the 10 year old and it's cheaper yeah. And it's just, it's intended for, for long drinks and for cocktails. Yeah. But to, to be, I mean, you, you have a reputation, you have a, one of the biggest brands in the world, single old brands in the world, Glen And to, to be um, that courageous and, and to do a very simple product, I mean, it, it's by itself, it's not memorable, but use it in drinks and it's terrific. But, I, I, I mean, I guess it's, it's only the bigger companies that can actually, as you say, be be that kind of brave to do that. Um, right. And there, there are so many sort of uh, whiskey writers and and influencers within the whiskey industry nowadays who 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 want to make the drink more accessible. Um, that you know the, the use of cocktails, and I, I I'm not dismissing any of this, but I do sometimes wonder. I mean, I don't know what you think about. It. Do you think sometimes that that confuses the the, the whiskey audience and how, how you should drink or what you should do with it when when we start introducing maybe as you say maybe a, a less remarkable bottle that is really intended for a different purpose to what we would mm. see typically scotch whiskey for i i think it could uh, confuse people i mean if you do that thing i mean you, you have to be very clear in your communication what this is aimed for mm -hmm. and there's another side of this. Sometimes you hear people in the industry saying that it's a perfect way of getting new people into drinking single malt yeah. whiskey yeah. by serving cocktails. I'm yeah. not completely sure about that. I'm not, I'm not sure either. Yeah. No, I, I think they will love the cocktail, but they yeah. will still hate the need the whiskey. whiskey. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but a, a lot of industry people I met have been saying this, and I'm still not uh, convinced. Yeah, it's it's great that you use you can use uh, uh, not not maybe the most expensive single malt, but that you can use single malts and cocktails. I love the whiskey cocktails, but yeah. I don't think you will um, transform a, a whiskey hater into a whiskey lover by serving yeah, the whiskey yeah. cocktails. And I, and I guess you wonder why they're doing that. I mean, I'm I'm aware that Diageo, in particular, we spoke at the start of the show um, about my, my trip into Strath Mill uh, not that long ago, and just spoke to some of the warehouse staff and. I was made aware that a lot, a lot, so well, not a lot, but a handful of the Diageo distilleries just now are, are just making gin mm. um, because they're not, there is no 
there's no need for them. They don't have a, the need to actually be, be producing whiskey just now. Mm. They can do any time they want. But yeah. they've got a handful of distilleries that are kind of sitting silent again. Um, and you wonder why you wonder why they feel the need to push people into a kind of weaker brand of a whiskey to make a cocktail rather than just introduce gin, which um, mm. would be as effective or maybe maybe even more effective. I don't know. Mm. I, I think that, uh, I mean, you're right, Strathmill, they've been making gin now for, I think, two years or so. Mm -hmm. uh, Glen Spey, the same yeah. there. Uh, yeah. yeah. Even though I, I think Glen Spey, I know I'm not sure about it, but uh, Glen Spey is so small that I'm not even sure they, they're going to continue making gin there. I mean, it's always been a very small, obscure distillery. Yeah. I mean, okay, yeah. Oban and Loch Nagar, they're smaller, but they're brands. Glen Spey yes. was never a brand. Yes. yes. I mean, like, Glen Spey is wonderful. I, mean, I, I love Glen Spey because you, the, the amount of times that you could have driven through Rothes and never known it was there. Yeah, <laughs> and, then right. one, and then one day you look and you go, oh, gosh, there's a, there's a distillery there. I, I missed it again. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a uh, it's it's interesting. Um, but, oh, okay, I, I I mentioned Glenmorangie. Jim. Uh, mm -hmm. love that distillery. Uh, my absolute go-to distillery. Um, wherever I see a bottle in any bar, unless it's too bloody expensive, I will order it, and that's Kleinbeach. But I'm not I'm yeah. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. I know that. Yeah, yeah. There are so many people that are in Kleinbeach. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, what, what about the 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 Brora coming back on the scene again? Then, yeah, I mean, it will be. I, I, I was there uh, three weeks ago and I had a walk around Brora, and they've done a tremendous job uh, resurrecting the distillery. And I mean, they put so much money into it. It was a beautiful distillery. Mm. Uh, and I went up to the Worm Tops. I had this nice look out to the North Sea, and it was amazing. Uh, We'll, we'll see in three, four, five, ten years from now what the new Brora is. I mean, the ones that are available now, most of us can't afford. Uh, it's yeah. even tricky to afford a, a tour around Brora. I think it's either three hundred pounds or six hundred pounds. But uh, right. it, well, it's I, I don't blame the idea. I mean, it's it's their yeah. choice to make it more exclusive. And you, yeah. if you don't want to spend that money on it. Walk over the road yeah, to find me. Right. That's right. No, yeah. no, but yeah, I wouldn't. I did say that. But <laughs> have a walk around yeah. Pine Beach. Uh, won't cost you very much. Go up to the bar. Uh, there, they have some whiskey cocktails you can order, and have yes. the same fantastic view uh, out to the North Sea. Uh, so, Brora, and we'll see about Portella and when that opens uh, in a year or two. Uh, we'll see about Rosebank. That will be exciting. Yes. What yes. the new Rosebanks will be. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, when talking about sort of uh, Brora and Kleinleash and getting whiskey cocktails in Kleinleash, they do a little bit of that at Cardew as well, uh, Johnny and Ginger and that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Have you been to the new uh, centre in Edinburgh, the Johnny Walker experience? Yeah, I was there in November and um, mm -hmm. I booked a tour. Um, I think there were three or four different tours. I, I booked the one where you go down to the bonded warehouse in the cellar and you get to try five different drams, and okay. you're probably a group of 12 people, and you have to make some kind of unanimous decision which ones we like the most. And, okay. and by that, they would then produce a very unique blend because they have 12 recipes from 12 uh, master blenders, the other master blenders. Okay. So, okay, you like that one, you like that one, and so and so. This looks like this blend that we're now going to produce for you and so so they have the cask and they draw samples from the cask and they make this blend according to what that particular master blender decided and then we get to try that as the sixth or seventh round mm -hmm. so it was quite fascinating quite uh, educational mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i got to try my first uh, tin in it, uh, rye okay okay how was it <laughs> Yeah, well, it was uh, surprising. I mean, I, I know it's not for sale, but they, they had a, a cask of 10 inch rye there. I think it was four or five years old. I, I think the Tunic, I mean, the, the, there's an interesting thing for me um, with the Tunic just now in that, um, you know, big, massive, 
factory a distillery um churning out spirit for the bigger for the bigger picture mm. um and a whiskey that i've kind of enjoyed but i've i've, I've had one of those difficult relationships with it okay. um, it, it gives me that I, I get a lot of distillery flavor from it and by that i mean a kind of chemicalness from it which sometimes i enjoy sometimes i don't um and i know it's not a, a widely drunk whiskey if you like um no, most, no. Peop most, most people who would see a bottle of chini on the shelf in its natural a uh, bourbon cask sort of color and mm -hmm. uh, would walk past it and wouldn't pick it up um, but there's, there's been a couple of uh, independent bottlers recently who have produced, uh, and this is another uh, subject we can talk about, who have produced a sherry matured one. So you've got this darker color yeah. and, and suddenly they become the popular dram mm -hmm. and, and, and get sold out uh, before the others that are maybe mm -hmm. a better known uh, distilleries. And I just think to myself, I'm, I'm not sure some of these people who have bought them would have bought them had they not been so dark. No, no, probably not. I mean, uh, a lot of people are either deceived by the color or they realize that they like whiskeys that are heavily shared I mean, it's not just about deception. Sometimes I have a lot of friends who, who are so keen on uh, sherry monsters. Whenever they see something dark and they know it's not been uh, uh, covered, they, they will go for it because they will get all these dried fruit flavors and uh, sometimes they are longing for the rubbery notes because that's what they're hooked on and um, yeah. and i think i don't know about you but when people ask me okay your favorite whiskey is well, it depends very much on the time of the year and on my mood Absolutely. and uh, yeah. so for the past six months or so i've been very much into to anything from refill bourbon because yeah. i can really sit and contemplate i can look for things there you don't yeah. look for things in the sherry monster you get what you get and you get loads of it yes. but the ref refill bourbon you can sit and wonder didn't i get a little rhubarb there and yeah if yeah. you're into that i mean you can either you can just enjoy it but yeah. sometimes you're in the mood of dissecting a whiskey yeah absolutely absolutely and, and that's that, that's an interesting thing i mean what, what what's your opinion on, on tasting notes in the this, the style of tasting notes that people deliver or develop these days. Um, by, by that, I mean, I, was, I read a bottle in the shop today and I actually thought, I'm not sure I know what any of these things are. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, thought, I actually thought, I'll take a photograph of that and I'll go and, I'll go and check up in Google because I'm, I'm really not sure what that particular flavour that this person no. described is. No, I, I think my... My best advice to to people when they say, uh, ask me, when I read tasting notes, whose tasting notes should I read? <laughs> you should read your own. Yes, you should yeah. never read anyone else. Yeah. Except if you if you, if you realize if, if you read, uh, Sash, uh, they're not tasting notes. They're novels on whiskey fun. But I, I like Sash. He's one of the best. But but they were too long for me. I mean. <laughs> It's like a whole chapter. Anyway, <laughs> if you find that your your palate is in tune with Sash's, then of course you should read them because if yeah. Sash likes something, maybe you will like it because you you have the same palate. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I, I think people should be careful about reading tasting notes. Um, I, I I rarely do tasting notes that much uh, unless I. Uh, have to publish them then of course and um, to be honest i apart from the world whiskey book i do every year one or two books for the swedish market and there are plenty of tasting notes in them yeah. and i order some 200 samples from various producers and i get them home to my to my studio here and i spend two three four weeks uh tasting them and deciding which ones go into the book and i and write the tasting notes and I have to say, these four weeks are the worst weeks of the year. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely hate doing that because then whiskey becomes scientific. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it takes yeah. the, the enjoyment away. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, I, I think you, people should try and not read other other tasting notes. I, I, I always had the best. My, my my idea was always the best thing to do was if you. 
if you are aware that there are tasting notes available, would be to go and spend some time with that whiskey yourself, maybe over two, two or three different kind of uh, sessions, two, two or three different times when you've had a drink of it. Mm -hmm. And then have a look at the tasting notes to see if what you've picked up matches some of what somebody else has said. Yeah. And, and sometimes I think, oh, yeah, I, I got that. Yeah, it's good. But, but not the other way around, looking for what well, says chocolate here. Yeah, I'm, I'm not picking up chocolate. You know, no. I, I always find that quite desponding if you do it that way around and you don't pick up what it says mm -hmm. on, the, mm -hmm. on the bottle. So the, the other way around is the way I always like to do it. There, there, there is another way of, of doing tasting notes that I think is superior to, to the to the written ones. And uh, I, I know David Wishart, he did it probably 20 years ago in one of his books. I think there are a few others who have tried it. I've tried it in my Swedish books. Where you decide on uh, having five or six or seven circles uh, that you fill out in accordance to how peated is it. Mm -hmm. So peat, uh, fruitiness, uh, green grassy, complexity, uh, different stuff. And you can uh, you can make small dots. If you have three dots on a peated, it's medium peated, or you could do circle uh, circles or whatever. I think that's more objective. Yeah. And uh, it's more useful to, to most whiskey drinkers. It will yeah. give you a hint on, on what you will be buying. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, to totally agree. Um, I mean, out, out with whiskey, um, I, I, I did read somewhere that you, obviously, you're a keen historian um, as well. Um, is, is, the, is, the, is, is that in history in general or the Scotch whiskey industry or whiskey or, or spirits whiskey? No, history? I would say it's history in general. Yeah. I, I think... Uh, that's been an interest uh, from very early on. Uh, but I, I definitely, as I mentioned, I discovered it uh, the very first time in 1980 when I was in Scotland that yeah. there was so much more to, yeah. to whiskey than just what was in the glass. Yes. Absolutely, the history. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I, I mean, I don't know if you've, uh, you'll, have, you'll have undoubtedly, well, you, you've obviously Charlie McLean's written in your uh, in the magazine on a number of occasions as well and mm -hmm. one one of our, our great historians i suppose in terms of the industry yeah um, absolutely absolutely yeah uh, I'll, one, I'll one the, the, the one the book that i've kind of read fairly recently is, is, i don't know if you've read this one uh, scotland's secret history no i haven't um, is that by charlie book. yeah uh, charles and a chap called daniel mccano okay um and i a, 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 I actually, my wife picked this up for me in a second-hand bookshop, uh, okay. which which was fantastic, and I've I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, the yeah, it, it isn't a lot of detail about the illicit distilling, and in this area where I live now, I, as I explained uh, earlier on in Aber mm -hmm. in North Aberdeenshire, was one of the kind of areas where there was a there was a, a huge amount of illicit distilling, mm -hmm. um, and the Cabrich, um, uh, not far south of us here, was a veritable hotbed of illicit distilling. Yeah, um, and and interestingly, the um, we're, well, there's hope that there'll be a distillery built there sometime soon. Um, Have you heard anything lately about it? Will it happen within the next couple of years? Or well, I, I think the last thing I read was I, I I believe so. I can't remember if I if I read something that said the funding was there or uh, the the planning permission. I think they've, I'm pretty sure they've actually started the excavation, mm -hmm. um, but I haven't actually driven over the cabin for a little while to go and see. Uh, how that's going to develop. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah, uh, talking about whiskey history, I mean, the the definitive book on uh, Scotch whiskey history must be uh, Charlie's uh, Liquid History. I think yeah. he published it maybe 15, 20 years ago. And whenever I speak to him, I say, you, you must do a new edition because now it's, okay, the old history is still there, but he stops around 1995 or something. Yeah. So I would love to see a new edition. And and we spoke about that right at the top of the program there, where, where we said you know the one of the one of the, the uh, inspirations for writing the book was the fact that there are so many of these books that have got lots and lots and lots of history, but nothing nothing up to date. Mm. Yeah, but it's so difficult to stay up to date because the whiskey world is evolving every single year. Yeah, and that's yeah. where the yearbook is just the perfect. Um, the, the the way I kind of wrote it down was it's the it's the glue for the industry. Um, there, there are so many things in it that help hold everything together year after year. And I think that's the fascinating mm -hmm. thing about, mm -hmm. um, about the yearbook. Um, one, one of the chaps, I can't remember who it was, I think it was James had said earlier on, how, how big do you see the, the whiskey yearbook growing? 
De depends on on what. Uh, okay, does it does mean in terms of size of the book or? I, I'm not sure what you meant. Number Jim, of pages you... or number of copies printed. Possibly. I, um, you, I, I, can also, I can also pose question, uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, in terms so, of pages, the tricky thing is, and um, in order to keep it below uh, 500 grams in weight, and that's really important when I send out the books, okay. I can't do anything more than 300 pages. So I'm struggling every year with all these new distilleries coming out. I have to rethink, okay, let's look at that big chapter, uh, 60 pages about uh, worldwide distilleries. Yeah. Uh, is it actually fair that I write five or six sentences about a small distillery in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which does produce single malt whiskey, but they only sell it in their small town or maybe in the yeah. state, but very few people around the world will ever get to taste it. So uh, every year I need to rethink a lot of the, these distilleries and give them a little less space, but they should always yeah. be mentioned. They should yeah. always be there. But in order to include uh, new Scottish distilleries, because most of my readers are interested, first and foremost, in Scotch single malt. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that's a fact. And um, in terms of copies sold, uh, I'm a one-man band. I'm my own publisher. Should I liaise with some big publishing company? I'm sure I would sell more copies. But the thing is, I, I would lose control. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They yeah. would get more money. I would get probably get less. So I'm, I'm not. I'm, I sell around a little less than twenty thousand copies uh, every year now. And it's not growing, and I'm happy with that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm, a, I mean, I'm inclined to agree with that. I like for for me as a as an avid reader and an avid fan, I like that it's a similar size and shape every year. I I know that there will be some bits of information in here that are similar in terms of the distillery, you know, the location and all that kind of stuff. But I like to know that that's there and it's slightly more updated. But I just like to know the other information. I love the articles. And it's just it's just all the ultimate reference book. Um, there's um in terms of we're not going to discuss say soccer or football, uh, yeah. but there's a there's a book in Scotland called the We Read Book, and it's literally a little pocket book yeah. um, that holds all the information on the fixtures for that season. So you can buy it and you can see every team that's playing who in Scottish football. Yeah, it tells you all the past winners of all the tournaments. It tells you. All the people that played for Scotland, how many times they've played for this country, and it's a fantastic reference book to have in your pocket. Mm -hmm. when you go to a football match, and somebody says to you, "Oh, who, who did Archie Gemmell play for again?" And you're like, "Oh, wait a minute," I'll, yeah. and you yeah. can say that. But so you've got all that old information there that you need, yeah. but you've also got who are we playing next week? Oh, yeah, I yeah. know that as well. So you need you need that book to be updated every year to give you that yeah. new information, but also to hold all the regular information as well. And, it, yeah, it, it, sounds like, it sounds like a book I should get a hold of. I mean, I love all these geeky books about with all the <laughs> details, and there's a new one next year. You can make small notes in it because you know there will be a new one next year. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Love yeah. That. I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you a copy of the wee red book, and you can <laughs> you can learn all of its Scottish football. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, how, how often do you come to Scotland every year, then, Ingvar? Uh, well, if we don't count uh, the pandemic, because that that, yeah, yeah, that was yeah. hard. Well, yeah, well, yeah. What, what was that like then? I mean, in terms of you've been traveling here regularly since yeah, yeah, something not be allowed. Yeah, good question. I mean, um, uh, I think my last trip before the pandemic to Scotland was in November 2019, and then my next trip was in November last year. So for two years. Uh, yeah. It was impossible for me to, to travel there, and yeah. I, 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 st I still get information because I keep in contact with all the yeah. distillery managers and other people, and I, I, I phone them, I send emails. But what, what I really missed was the inspiration I get from from coming there. Yeah. Uh, I, I I noticed that really strongly when I went to to. Um, Speyside in, in uh, November last year. And I remember the first distillery we came to was uh, Balmenach. 
I hadn't been there for three, four, five years. And I stepped out and I heard the sound and I felt the smell of the mashing in. Uh, I got close to the stills. I felt the heat from the stills and the lovely smell from the warehouse and from the mm. fermentation, from the washbacks. And I had missed it so much. I almost got tears in my eyes. But then I realized mm. what, what I had been missing because I had to walk around with uh, Kevin McPherson, uh, the still manager. And we had a great tour there, uh, just the two of us. And what I had missed most of all was the people, mm. chatting with the people uh, about whiskey and everything. Uh, so I, for two years, I missed that kind of inspiration. I managed to do two editions of the Malt Whiskey book, and I hope they weren't worse than the other ones. But No, not at all. I've got them both, and I've read, I read them all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it, yeah. it, it was trickier to do it because yeah. um, I wasn't, I wasn't that inspired as I usually yeah. am when I have the chance to, to go to Scotland. And I mostly go to Scotland. I, I know people think I've been to every still in the world. Of course not. I couldn't afford it and I don't have the time. Yeah, I, I, I've been to the Scandinavian ones. I've been to Kavalan a few times. I've been to yeah. India. Uh, but otherwise, for the other distilleries, I have to rely on keeping in touch with the people without being there physically. But that also goes back to, first of all, my main interest is in Scotch whiskey. And for most of the readers, that's their interest as well. So I tend to go back to Scotland ever so often. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there was a time in 2007 when I could say I had been walking around every malt distillery in Scotland. But that was in 2007. Yes. Then a lot of things happened many yeah. new distilleries so i i think there are 134 working malt distilleries in scotland now and i'm still missing uh five or six that i haven't been to okay so yeah. what are some of the some of the newer ones yeah that's, one of them is quite old and that's avon derrick on, on louis okay. yeah i mean yeah. they opened in 2008 but yeah. my travels never took me out on louis yeah no i haven't been there i haven't been to harry's um there are three or four more that I haven't been to yet, but um, I'm working on it. I, I, I'm not sure I will ever going to say again that I've been to every distillery because I don't think that will happen because <laughs> you have three or four, five new ones every year. Yeah, just to just keep growing. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, um, a, a slightly kind of controversial question, I suppose, in terms of some one of the older distilleries that are that are doing things a little bit different. And we spoke about the positive nature of Suntory being involved with Glengiri. Um, how, how do you feel about what's happening with Brown Foreman and Glen Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, first of all, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be... Um, uh, say anything too negative about Brown Forman, but I'm, I'm not surprised. I mean, it's a big American company, mm -hmm. uh, mainly known for Jack Daniels and a lot of other products. And I realized that they wanted to, they, they used to be in, involved in the Scotch whiskey industry. I think they had a piece of Glen Morangier for a while, but that was two, three decades ago. And it was clear that they wanted to, to come in to the Scotch whisk business again with uh, with uh, Ben Rear, Glenn Gronach and Glenn Glasser. I, I think they should be really careful about a solid brand like Glenn Gronach because I know when, I mean, when Billy Walker bought them one by one, uh, Ben Rear was nothing. They, they had yeah. tremendous whiskey, but it wasn't a brand. Glenn Glasser definitely wasn't a brand. But yeah. the one in the middle that they bought, Glenn Gronach, that was a brand with huge, yeah. following, not huge, but a solid following. Yeah. And um, to you should really be careful when you tamper with the recipe. And, and, and the, so, no, I'm a bit surprised there, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm even more surprised that they haven't sold off Glen Glasgow yet. Yeah, that, that is a surprise. And my, my understanding was that Billy, Billy would have quite liked to have kept it, I think, when... 
uh, when 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 he was looking or when when the offer came in for the distilleries, but Brown, Brown Foreman wanted them all. And yeah, given he, that, he wanted. Given, to keep it, yeah, know, but, that, that's my understanding. Um, and my my you know my, my knowledge of Glen Glasgow, which is just up the road from me here, is one of my mm -hmm. favourite distilleries for for all sorts of reasons. I used to take my children. When they were young camping um up there's a campsite beside the beach right beside the distillery yeah. so i was always aware it was there I, I i it took me many years after camping there that i actually tasted the whiskey um and but uh, it's very much the ugly duckling that's hanging on by a by a fingernail to life um yeah and you, you just you just want somebody to come in with with individual funding you know almost one one group of people to come in and look mm -hmm. after it and and yeah. manage it as one as one kind of entity because uh, obviously it, you, you like the whiskey as much as i do oh the God, not, it's, it's a it's good incredible. whiskey i love it yeah yeah, yeah but I, I don't see it fit into the to, yeah. to the tree of distillers that brown foreman uh, are working with so i i thought they would have sold it uh, a couple of years yeah. ago but uh, they're still hanging on to it I, I keep putting my lottery ticket on any every week in the hope that i maybe win Several, <laughs> several millions like a good day. Yeah, there's, <laughs> um, very little, there's very little production going on though. I mean, it's it, just for it, it stopped again during um, during the COVID lockdown. It started again, I think, last summer for a period of time, but I think it's pretty much stop start just now. Yeah, um, I, I mean, there is a desire to, to get it going again, I think, but there, there's no visitor center there just now. Um, mm. it's hoped that that'll kind of come up again. And it, you know, it's one of the distilleries we would like to get more involved with in terms of the academy that I was telling you about as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and access to it. Um, but I, I just, I mean, the, for me, the, one of the biggest problems for it is is that it's it's off the beaten track as well. Um, and distilleries for me that are off the beaten track very much become factory distilleries. Mm. And if it's not part of the bigger factory issue, then what what is it there for? What's it doing? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I would love it to be in the hands of a of an individual group um, that were just and, just in one distillery. And, yeah. And talking about your neighboring uh, distilleries, I would love to finally see a Vista Center at uh, Ardmore. Yes. Uh, yes. I know they've been talking about it for 10, 15 years. And whenever I come there, or whenever yeah. I'm in contact, yeah. what are the plans for the Vista? Yeah, well, it's not there yet. We're thinking about it. Well, they, 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 I, yeah, I mean, I guess exactly that. And the, you'll have been to the distillery and seen the, the kind of, the, the sort of shed that they were going to use or the area they were going to use as the visitor centre that's just yeah. never been developed. But oh. you're right, it's, it's um, having, having been around it, it's an absolutely beautiful distillery. Yeah. The, and and they, the, they've saved so much uh, memorabilia and, and oh. uh, old ledgers and there's uh, so yeah. much to, to look at. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the the mast tun is a thing of beauty. Mm. It's just incredible. Um, mm. The still house with all that brickwork underneath, it's yeah. just incredible. Yeah, just fascinating. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, we, we need we need to win a massive lottery win and uh, get in there. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so so what's the what's the kind of big plans for the rest of this year then, Ingvar? What's um... Um, I think I'm. From now on, usually, um, I, I started working on the new Malt Whiskey book a um, couple of months ago. And um, yeah. so usually from now on, I, I'm just uh, doing more research, uh, writing, and uh, so and leave all the pages to the printer in the beginning of September. Uh, I will have a, one small trip left, and that's um, in two weeks' time, I'm going to Orkney for just a few days, okay. which will be nice. I haven't been to Highland Park for at least... Eight years or so, so okay. that's nice. Yeah. yeah. Is Scapa in operation now? We have various conversations in the shop where people think it's it's not working just now, and other people say it is. Are you aware of whether it's in operation just now? Or I, I, I think it's working. Uh, yeah. The problem is, uh, I mean, I, I deal with all the companies in, in the industry, and some are easier to deal with than others, uh, and. Chivas, I mean, they're, they're good people and they've invited me or when I want to come to a distillery, they're always very courteous and say, absolutely. You, yeah. you'll, as usual, you have a walk around with the distillery manager. And, uh, but there are some questions you shouldn't ask. You shouldn't yes. ask about 
Uh, you can ask about capacity, no problem, but don't ask about production, uh, the real production for that year. They won't reveal that. Yeah. So they are a bit more secretive on certain things than other companies are. So I haven't heard... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll check now when I'm up at Highland Park. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. easy. You can just have a walk down and, and to, to Scapa and see what's happening. Again, it's one of these whiskies that have that's got a very loyal fan base. People, yeah, people absolutely love Scapa, and whenever we get it in the shop, it tends to sell it fairly quickly because it's oh, you've got some Scapa, fantastic. Mm. I mean, just the standard, you know, the Skirin and the Arcadian, you know, just the standard kind of bottles. But it's yeah, it's, yeah. it's not something you see a lot of in in, uh, in shops. On the odd occasion, it'll turn up in a supermarket, but uh, very rare these days. Did uh, Did you like, or do you like the peated one, Glanza? I never tasted that one. I didn't get no. to try that one. That's yeah. not scalpa to me. Mm -hmm. Scalpa to me shouldn't be peated. But, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. Love them. I so, so some of these distilleries that have got a bit more of a kind of saline flavour. So Pulteney um, for me, and probably Scapa as well. That so the Huddert from Pulteney, mm -hmm. um, I don't find as enjoyable as the as the normal Pulteney because it no. the peat the peat to me kind of gets a little bit confused for me with the salinity, mm -hmm. um, and I love I love that saltiness of Pulteney, um, yeah. so maybe the same maybe the same would have been the case for the because um, because interestingly the the Glen, I love Glen Glasser, but I'm not so keen on the Torfa. Um, again the peated version, and I, mm -hmm. I wondered if, if if my palate gets confused with mm -hmm. the peatiness and the saltiness. Um, so, but it, yeah. could, could it also be, uh, I see what you mean, um, could it also be that it would be smarter to do a standalone brand? Like, I mean, you're enjoying Chiboka now. Yeah. And yeah. Chiboka is Chiboka. Yeah. Tomato is Tomatin. Yeah. So they're two different brands. So they yeah. have cleverly conducted it that way. So they're two yeah. different. Uh, answer, that, yeah, that's a peated Scalp, I shouldn't be on Hadda, as you mentioned. Yeah, uh, I think Tom and Tao they have done a good thing about having old Ballantru, and that's a different brand. Different, different we brand. Don't have Tom and Tao here, different brand. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You, you just you just put a shiver down my spine because the one of <laughs> one of my favorite distilleries is Glen Cadam. Um, I, I love I love Glen Cadam. I love everything that they produce, um, yeah. and as far as I'm aware, there is not a peated Glen Cadam, and I'm just thought. Oh my God! I hope they never ever do one because I just don't think that would work. Um, and it, you just you just give me a horrible fear and imagine yeah. the fear of something. <laughs> I, no, I, I share a sentiment there. I mean, I yeah. love in Caram, and they, they have a huge range. I mean, uh, yes. yeah. five, six, seven different uh, styles. But uh, no, please don't do Pete. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> I agree with you. you. Stand outside the gates, no Pete. <laughs> oh, no, but it's so delicate. It's so refreshing in its own way they shouldn't tamper yeah. with and, and and as you're saying that the perfect drink for this time of year yeah absolutely wonderful yeah. drink for this time of year just it fabulous yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely it's a summer whiskey in, indeed it is yeah absolutely yeah. yeah um so what 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 else do you do when you're not um, involved with whiskey and and, and writing and, and working what would you do for a bit? Well, I mean, it's it's hard, isn't it? Because some people say to me, "What do you do in your days off?" And I tend to think, "Well, maybe I'll go and visit that distillery. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll go and this part of the process." You find yourself lured back into it. But are, are there other aspects of life that you spend a bit of yeah, time? Yeah, uh, try to spend some time on um, on bird watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been. Uh, I think that the interest started already when I was twelve or thirteen, and. Uh, for the following 20 years, I was I went around everywhere in Sweden, uh, twitching, yeah. Uh, yeah. trying to find new uh, species uh, to my list. And uh, it slowed down. It slowed down considerably over the years. But uh, yeah. I, st I still enjoy getting out in, in, into the wild and um, out to the coast. We're quite, very near to the coast. And uh, yeah. have a walk there at three, four, five hours. I have my binoculars with me and... Um, do some bird watching, yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I guess you you must get quite a lot of migratory birds there as well, and similar to, yeah. to what we do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. And uh, especially in the autumn uh, for the winter migration, uh, we have a great uh, spot. It just uh, takes 30 minutes to come there uh, from uh, where I live. 
and it's one of the best uh, migration spots in in the, the whole of the world oh, especially yeah. for uh, birds of prey raptors yeah. oh wow wow okay yeah and, and to me, they're, they're the most fascinating of birds, I think, for, from my point of view. Yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. Phenomenal. me too, yeah. yeah. The, the other ones I love, of course, are the, the swifts and the swallows. I'm fairly certain I saw my first swallow today when I was, well, I thought it was a swift rather than a swallow, uh, but my wife thinks that she saw a swallow recently, so maybe I was wrong, but it seemed to be a, a little bit sharper uh, yeah. and more angular, so I, I think it was a swift, but uh, I was driving to work this morning and I, yeah. I got that kind of skip in my heart thinking, you know, here we go, they've arrived. <laughs> well, that's a, I mean, that's a good sign. It's a yeah. sign of summer yeah. coming. I mean, so if it was a swift, and I'm sure it was, it yeah. probably was one of the first ones. Yeah. I haven't well, seen a swift here yet, but um, you're more to the south, Yeah, I think. Yes, I think we, we are still. We're still, we are equivalent across is, well, yeah, we're, yeah, we're probably more, Netherlands, Denmark. Yeah, I was saying North, Amsterdam yeah, or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. a bit more to the south. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, listen, Ingrid, thank you so much for joining us tonight. That's been absolutely fascinating. Um, and thank you. We, we we must get a chance to meet up with you sometime. Um, sometime when you're in Scotland, if you if you've got time, I'm sure your agenda is always very busy. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm always trying to, to have a couple of days where I can just take it easy, meet up with yeah. people, not not just going to the distilleries. So absolutely, I would love yeah, absolutely. that. Absolutely, and uh, please, I mean, ha happy to, have to come come visit us in Aberhurdon, and we can go for a wander up in the up in the Murray Coast. And I would love that. We want, yeah, absolutely, that'd be absolutely fantastic. Um, and if, if you have any plans to go to Sweden, sorry. If you have any plans to go to Sweden, you know you're Well, I've to. never been, so I would I would love to go. I would absolutely love to go. Um so yeah. yes, I'll, uh, I'll I'll certainly reciprocate for for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, um, good, good. For, for sure. Um I'll I'll get you to hold on just uh, shortly once we but we'll, we'll we'll end off live. I'll say cheerio to the guys. Um so uh, chaps, th thanks very much for joining us again tonight. Um I hope you've enjoyed uh, our conversation. I certainly have. Um I feel we could talk with Ingvar for for a very long time, and hopefully we'll maybe get uh, get them back on again sometime soon. We uh, we do often say to people we need a part two, sometimes maybe even a part three. Um, and I know that Mike um, is very busy tonight. He's having a, a a rather nice dinner in Glasgow as part of the course, so um, he won't be missing us too much. But he does like to meet people on the on the chat, so he'll be desperate to to get on the chat next time and and have a conversation with you, Ingvar. Um, so we'll definitely get you back on uh, at some point. Um, next week is the – we've got Greg Schwartz. Uh, we've got Greg Schwartz who um, from LA, the Greg Schwartz of the Water of Life uh, film, and I think they're busy making another film about independent bottlers. So we'll catch up with Greg and find out where they are with that. Um, usual time again, guys, 7 o'clock. Um, so thanks once more, and uh, hopefully we'll see you then. Uh, in the meantime, good night from uh, from both of us. Cheers, Cheers guys. Everyone. Yeah. Bye bye.